Oh, it says this will not be visible to attendees until the scheduled start time. Did you see that? Okay. But since we're live. Looks like we're recording already. Do you know where folks can get the handouts? Is that in in the options for them in, during our session? Fair question. I think if you go to the main agenda page okay. and you click on this session, it should show up underneath. Okay. Because I looked again this morning and you could see them. Sounds good. Will we know when people are in? Because mm. we're never going to see anybody else. Well, we'll know when they take our poll. Another reason to do it, right? There's attendee list, but I can't see. Most of them are administrators. We're down to a minute. They say 11 o'clock, they mean 11 o'clock. Grief, that's nerve wracking. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight. Good morning. Welcome to our session with Personas Project. We hope you've already seen our handouts that we've uploaded on the main session page. My name is Kim Sandoval. I'm an Institutional Research and Assessment Specialist at South Piedmont Community College. I've been here about two and a half years and I've served in analytical and compliance roles at various other public agencies for the about 10 years as well. Um, if you've already joined us, you are welcome to complete the poll. We hope you can see that. We just wanted to get a feel for who was in the room as we go through this presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christine. I'm Christine Teach. I'm an Institutional Research Analyst at South Piedmont. I've been at the college for about five years and worked in higher education and K-12 for about 15 years. Um, as Kim said, please complete the poll and um, you can use the chat box at any time to tell us hello so we know we're not alone here in this room and um, ask any questions as we go through today's presentation and we'll stop and um, answer those questions as we see them and we can also answer your questions at the end. Let's see. Great, we have some poll results already. Uh, it looks like our IE and IR colleagues are represented, several of you, um, a couple of student affairs and advising, administration, academics, and other. Um, so we'll try to uh, not get too far into our IR data speak as we go through our presentation um, today. So uh, if you want to get started, Kim, 
Uh, so as I said, we're from South Piedmont. We're the newest of the 58 community colleges. We serve about 10,000 students a year, which is about average size for the state. And we um, are located just south of Charlotte and north of South Carolina. Um, and we have four campuses serving Anson and Union counties. So in today's session, we're going to start and give you um, a brief background of why we started this project, but then we're gonna jump straight into the finished project, what we produced and how people are using it at the college. And then we'll circle back to the logistics. So how we completed it and walk you through some of the decision points there um, and some other examples of how other colleges and businesses are using the personification of data. So we started this project and you can certainly relate to this at your college, I'm sure. So you are considering a policy or procedure change. Maybe you're gonna discuss some of the great ideas you're hearing today from the Performance Partnership Summit. Um, so you're all sitting around the room or virtually in teams and you're thinking about how this is gonna impact our students, how we can best serve our students. And it's human nature that the student that we bring to mind and that we advocate for in that room are the students that we're most familiar with. So who is in our program, who often takes our courses, um, who comes into our office. Um, but obviously each of the 58 community colleges serves a really diverse set of students. So if you think about, we serve credit and non-credit, we serve students who are high school age through you know adults who've been in the workforce a while. We have one day personal interest fund classes to multi-year curriculum and workforce education classes. So that's just the tip of the iceberg and some of the diversity of the students that we serve and some of the programming that we offer. And so it can be challenging to keep all of those things in mind as we're um, thinking through how these things are gonna impact our students. And so that's really why we started this project. So in other words, we wanna paint a fuller picture of who our students are. We want everyone at the college to have a general understanding of who our students are and just start to have discussions with one another so that they can make connections. Um, so we also always in IEIR want to make our data more engaging to non-data faculty and staff. Basically, folks who hear data, who see a chart or a graph and wanna cover their ears, cover their eyes, um, but hopefully personifying student data. So in other words, having a picture, having a story can help to invite them to the conversation, to get them interested so they want to engage more, they want to ask questions, things like that. So our audience for this is our internal faculty and staff. Um, this was exploratory, so we didn't have an external request. This is something Kim and I um, saw a need for, and so we developed it as we went. And we were focused on um, understanding the students who we have, the students in front of us. And so we were focused on lots of enrollment types of, of behaviors, uh, demographics of our students, that kind of thing. And so those factors drove um, the decisions that we made and we'll walk through some of those decision points. So you can think about how that might be different at your college, what kind of decisions you would need to make. And it also drove um, the output that we wanted. So we wanted something that was easy for folks to look at and think about as they were evaluating some different initiatives or just trying to keep our students in mind to, to better serve them. Um, so as we go through showing you what our final project looked like, um, you might have something different in mind. So as we're obviously at the Performance Partnership Summit, you might wanna focus on students who were in a specific cohort and better understanding them so that you can then impact their enrollment in English courses, for example. Um, so as we're going through, think about some different ways that this type of analysis might apply to your college. Um, it might be useful for the things that you're doing. So with that in mind, what did we produce? As Christine said, we wanted the data to be visualized and to be engaging. Um, dashboards are fantastic, but as Christine said, some of our faculty and our staff can't relate as much to that. So when we did this particular data visualization, you may have already seen it if you've looked ahead at our handouts, but these are our 10 student personas that we created. And these are the illustrations of the 10 summary students. When we put together this analysis and presented it to our staff and faculty, we wanted them all to be together in one place at that initial introduction. 
Um, and as we put forth these 10 students together, we proposed some questions and our, to our faculty and staff to try to encourage them to think about how they would use this information once we gave it to them. Um, things we talked about with them in our summary were just how these students might impact the decision making. If um, students have different needs that we hadn't considered, how might we need to change the way we make some of our decisions on staff? We wanted to encourage collaborations and connections interdepartmentally, um, especially in areas that maybe hadn't considered similarities between their students or their programs in the past. And we also wanted to encourage our faculty and staff to learn more if they noticed there was a student who had similarities to those participating in their own programs. Again, where could they draw parallels and where could we learn from one another internally? And then finally, with outreach, who, are not, who aren't we serving within our community? And how might we reach out to them? So a friendly reminder, as you've probably seen working with data, um, when you do a visualization like this, um, we encourage faculty and staff to remember that these personas do not represent any one particular student. It's the, um, it's the overall summary of the data, um, and they might just happen to look like a student that they have in a class or a program. This particular photograph is a picture of, it's a marketing photo that was taken several years ago that is 10 of our students, but we wanted to, again, encourage that the data is representative and it should not um, be taken as representing a particular student that is attending here. So we wanted to create an individual one-page summary for each student. So with that in mind, uh, we, created these focus pages for each student. Um, the one page summaries we wanted to keep very basic. We wanted to include the normal kind of demographic data points that you see so often in IEIR and keep those consistent um, between doing two, 10 students and Christine and I sharing the creation of these. We had to have something that was consistent so that it made sense as you flowed through all, all 10 students. And then we also had um, unique points from each program that we picked up and those are in the bottom. We then um, used our data fire that we send out about every other week during the fall and spring semesters and sent those out to faculty and staff. Normally those are one page data summaries and in these cases we packaged two or three pages together so that they would have that information to review um, together side by side. We also created a full report. That full report is 28 pages. It has some very specific side-by-side -side, side -side summaries. Um, for instance, Emily and Kayla both represent our students that are in high school that are taking courses, either in our early college program or our career and college promise programs. Um, on first glance, you might consider that they're practically identical, but as we look deeper into the data, we could see that there were some distinct differences. So by putting all 10 of the students with the summary data side by side, we wanted to kind of highlight and give, again, faculty and staff the opportunity to look at that a little more closely. In addition to that, in the full report, we had some summary data about our full area, our whole service area that provides some context Obviously, if the percentages of our entire service area look a certain way, that sometimes impacts who we're serving within our programs. And then we also provided some in-depth data in that full report about the various students within a specific program so that um, our staff in those service areas could provide that in more detail. Back to the data details a little bit. As I said, these darker green and blue were the standard demographics that we typically provide, and then the lighter colored areas, and then the yellow or gray down below were places where we could dive a little more deeply into the specific programs. Again, looking across curriculum and continuing ed, we had very different programs we needed to compare. So we were trying to visually um, provide some indication of where those numbers or, or those demographics and those pieces of detail might be different between our students. 
Um, and again, we wanted to provide as much depth and dimension so that the students seemed as real as possible and not just flat statistics on a page. So we went to other places for some of that data and Christine will talk about that in a little more detail further on. So who is using this data across our college? As we got ready to release the information in talking internally with our institutional advancement division, we found out that the marketing department was working on an outreach campaign strategy. So we had this fantastic internal brainstorming session. They talked a little bit about their thoughts and their perspectives. We talked about our data and where we were coming from. And that gave us an opportunity to provide insight and feedback to one another before we released on a broader scale to um, faculty and staff as a whole. We also found out that our campus equity team was thinking about doing some analytical research and we told them we were already taking care of it. So that allowed them time and focus to um, highlight the areas where they saw need and let us move forward with the data piece of it. Of course, our senior leadership team got the full report as well as the summary data that was back in October. And then finally, the data fire series I alluded to earlier, we released to all faculty and staff over several weeks between January and late February. And then the insights from the data. Anytime you work with data or, or even with the program, sometimes you suspect things, you think you're seeing consistencies or parallels. By running this data at the high level um, that we did, we were able to confirm some tendencies that we'd suspected over years. One of these was the university's to um, the four-year universities that our students are most likely to transfer to. We were able to confirm that. And we also made some interesting discoveries. We realized that we have a lot of public service um, students that are continuing their education here. And when we started looking in more depth at that data, we were able to see just exactly how long some of those students are with us um, over a long period of time. We were also able to look at personal interest and see the variety of courses that students within our community are taking just, just for basic interest. So those were two areas that we hadn't expected that doing this data analysis allowed us to see more clearly. So as far as how we completed this, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Christine. Thanks. So hopefully um, with those finished products, you're thinking of um, something similar or at least some components that might be useful at your institution. So we completed this project over the summer, last summer. So it was just Kim and I, and obviously we had a million other things going on, um, but it took us about uh, three months to complete along with our other responsibilities. Um, so we started with our hypotheses. So no matter what area of the college that you work in right now, I would bet that you have some hypotheses about what your student groups would be, what those student personas or 10 student groups would be. And you probably have a good idea of what some of those variables would be that you would want to look at. So we started there and then we pulled together a large data set and we started to code those variables. So we have age group, what are some meaningful ways to code or group those variables? And then test out our hypotheses. You know, these different groups that we thought of, are those gonna work out when we look at the data? Are those really meaningful ways to, to describe and separate our students? And of course, that led us to need more data. So we refined our data set and then worked through our final group assignments. And that really took the longest, um, the longest part for us, the, the hardest decisions to make. Then we divided those in half. So Kim, um, <laughs> Kim, I hear you're typing. Kim did um, five of them and I did five. And we really dove in to hear, to um, dig into their stories, which was the most interesting part. Then we created those visual reports and then we got feedback. So we sent that one page about that student to the um, population on campus, the faculty and staff that worked with them all the time. And we asked them, does this make sense? Are we missing anything? Is there anything you would add or change? And so they gave us some great feedback. So in terms of the logistic, we used three years of data and we did that because we knew that we had some small populations that we wanted to look at and some trends over time that we wanted to even out. Logistically, it would be much easier to use one year of data. 
So you might think about, obviously, the impact of COVID and are the students you have now um, going to be representative of the students you envision having, having in the near future? Um, basically, so that whatever your finished product is that you use for decision making, is that really going to be valid and, and helpful? Um, in the beginning of the process, we decided to use 10 student personas. We felt like that was the most people would really have the bandwidth to read and understand and think about during those decision making meetings. Um, but that again, is something to balance with how much diversity there is in your student body. Obviously, if you wanted to fully cover all the diversity in our students, we would need 10,000 student personas because each of them bring unique challenges and um, strengths to the table. Um, so again, thinking about what can people really, uh, you know, comprehend, have the bandwidth in our busy lives to really think about um, versus what's going to accurately capture the diversity of the students that we serve. Each of our students was counted in one and only one group, so the order in which we coded and categorized our students was really important for this project. And we also wanted to make sure that the students' personas were approximately equivalent, meaning we didn't want one of our sample students to represent 200 students and another one to represent 2,000. So that was another challenge to try to keep them approximately equal. And as I said, deciding on the student groups was really the hardest part for us. So we made several attempts to, you know, go back and forth and decide where to put each of our students in those personas. So I mentioned accuracy versus clarity before, but here I also mean if I wanted each of those 10 sample students to be as distinct from one another as possible, I could really be very precise in how I slice and dice those demographic and different enrollment variables, but then explaining to the end user who's in what group and having them be able to readily use that during a decision-making meeting would be very complicated. So trying to balance those two variables, keeping in mind what your most important variables are. So if I had decided what's most important and Kim had separately decided and we defined our group separately, we would come out with very different groups. So we collaborated up front based on our own hypotheses and what the data showed us to determine what the most important variables were. And then I'll say it, you know, every, every slide I can, it's really the most important part of any project that you do to keep your purpose in mind because it can be really easy to get lost in the data. There's so many cool things you can do. There's a million different ways you could categorize your student. But at the end of the day, what are you hoping to do with this? And what's going to be the most efficient way to help your end user do that? So here are some of the variables that we use to define our student groups. So obviously demographics, none of that is surprising to you. Age, sex, race, ethnicity. For our community college county, because we serve two very different counties, so that's important. And dual enrollment status. We have a very large dual enrollment population, so that's an important variable for us. First gen and Pell Grant status. We use their um, load in credit or non-credit, what they were studying and their enrollment schedule. So are they taking classes online, evening, weekend, that type of thing. So then we um, defined our groups using cross tabs. So we had our hypotheses uh, drafted about here's a set of student groups that we think is meaningful. And we compared that on those variables that we had identified. And um, the difference is really jumped out almost immediately. So you can see in this very simple example, our overall college population is 52% female. But for our curriculum health programs, it's 85% female. And for our non-credit public safety, is 27% female. So that's really the differences that we were looking for. So over time, looking at multiple variables and multiple iterations of those groups, the 10 final groups that we used really became pretty clear. So before we continue, do you have any questions about defining the groups? So a little bit inside baseball if you're not in the data all the time. Um, but for us, it was the hardest part because there's no one right answer for how to define those groups. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'll keep going. But if you think of any questions, just put them in the chat. So the next slide shows our 10 students. And so Kim talked a little bit about these. Um, so this is the order in which we coded them. So the first two, Emily and Kayla, are duly enrolled students. 
And Kim mentioned we thought initially they might be just one student, but it's a really large population at our college. And then also their enrollment behaviors ended up looking quite different. So Emily is for early college and Kayla is for our CCP programs. Sarah, Taylor, and Hannah are defined based on the curriculum primary program. So initially we thought we would define these based on full-time, part-time. I really thought um, online enrollment activity was going to be the defining factor, but the curriculum primary program actually described them the best. And then the remainder of them are described based on their non-credit course activity. And so again, we initially tried the location, the length of the course, student age, all kinds of other things that did not define the student groups uniquely. Um, so Maria is for ESOL, Jonathan is high school equivalency, Christopher is for non-credit public safety, Lisa is personal interest, and Michael is kind of everything else. So initially, we defined then all of the non-credit course prefixes separately and then started to compare them on those different variables until we were finding that some of the course departments really look similar and made sense to put together. So non-credit public safety is a, is a good example of that. All of those course prefixes, they all look pretty much the same in terms of their demographics and their enrollment behavior. So it made sense for all of them to go in the same group. So non-credit workforce training in particular has a lot of diversity. And so in that one page summary that Kim showed at the very bottom, um, there's some additional descriptives. So it says, uh, customized training is included here, and it has a sentence, what is customized training for our faculty and staff who don't know, um, and it has a few um, descriptive statistics about that population. And then underneath it, it says trades. Again, a sentence, what is trades? How are you defining that here? And then what's different about trades versus customized training? So even though we kind of lumped a lot of things together in non-credit workforce training, and even though generally speaking, they do look the same, we're still able to, able to so, show some of the diversity underneath that in that one page summary. So once we had our 10 groups, we dove in to tell the stories and that's where um, the, the information really diverged. So obviously curriculum and non-credit, they had very different data points that were gonna be relevant to tell their story. Um, but for both areas, we used a lot of information on their previous college experience or degree earned, both from the National Student Clearinghouse and from our own data. So we found a lot of interesting things about interrupted enrollment, how long ago students enrolled, if they had a previous degree. We looked at what kind of courses they took with us, their, where they took courses. Again, we have four campuses, um, their GPA, you know, how they're doing in our courses, where they live, their um, high school information, especially for our high school students, did they receive financial aid, and then information from their application, like are they employed, are they married, do they have kids, all of that kind of thing. So we also used some information that was not student level data, so it wasn't directly tied to an individual student record. So like information from the census, so we wanted to know how many residents in our service area might fall into this group, might um, be eligible or be interested in this type of service. So for the ESOL student persona, how many residents in our service area do not speak English very well, according to that census data? So we have that there. I mentioned the explanatory information about the programs and courses. So not everybody at our college knew what customized training was, so can we put a one sentence summary that gets them started and then that might pique their interest and they can reach out and they can ask for additional information. I mentioned um, sharing the one-page personas with the different areas of the college before we published. And so during that review of the drafts, they had some good feedback and, and they were also able to supply some additional information that we don't have in IE. So for ESOL, they added um, how many languages and countries our students came from, which again helped to um, be a little bit more descriptive of those populations. And then the system office obviously has a lot of information about um, well, lots of things, but the one in particular that we used for this was um, a study that they did with DPI about the high school graduating class post-secondary enrollment. And so again, it wasn't linked to our specific students, but we could say generally for this population, this percentage enroll in college and this percentage enroll 
in community colleges. And so that was helpful just to paint a bigger picture there. Uh, let's see. So I see a question. I can answer it now. Did you have to complete an institutional review board process prior to conducting the project? So we didn't. So this is part of regular um, data analysis that we would complete in institutional research with our student level data. So it's not being published as part of a research study. Um, it's all aggregate data, so no individual students are being identified. So even though we're personifying the student, we're saying, hey, here's Maria. It's not an actual student, Maria. It's just an aggregate, and we're describing the aggregate in terms of as if, as if it were a specific student. So that part, you know, sometimes can be um, a little bit confusing. So then the... Um, in terms of the presentations for the student names, of course, we wanted to be data driven. So we looked at the most frequent names in our data set. And you can also go to the Social Security Administration and look up the year of birth in the state and see the most common names. And fun fact, they matched. So it's cool when math and statistics comes together in real life. And for the images, we worked on that from the very beginning because that's not something that we normally do in IE. And so we reached out to marketing and our digital media program, and they recommended Blush Designs, which is a free website where you can create the images that you see on this slide. So Kim mentioned in the beginning that we wanted to make sure that our personas were relatable, that they seemed like a real student, but that our faculty and staff didn't think of an individual student that they knew in real life. And so that's why we went with this sort of realistic cartoon is what we were calling it image. So you can go more realistic. So you can use actual photos of your students or you can use um, stock images or you can go to the other extreme and they have some that are just faces or just or like more purple skinned, sort of very cartoonish. Um, so we went somewhere in the middle of those options. So Blush Designs is just one example. There are more out there. But before you get too far into it, make sure that there are enough options to represent all of the students that you want. So we had 10 students, and we wanted them to look like 10 different people. So you do have to make sure that you can get enough uh, skin and hair tones and clothes and all, all these different types of things. So it really does look like 10 different people. So Kim spent a lot of time trying to get, get all of that sorted out. And then one thing that I don't think we planned to do from the beginning, um, but that ended up being really cool, was using the student backgrounds. So on those one-page summaries, there's a little background behind the student that I think really helps to paint the picture and provide some context for who that student is. And those came from free online images, too. And we created our people in Word, but you can create them in a variety of um, software packages. So where are others using the personification of data? I think Christine may have alluded to this earlier. Um, there are several places where you might have seen this approach used similarly. Um, if you've been reading some of the higher education um, manuals and, and um, summaries recently, Amarillo College has talked a lot about Maria and Minnesota State has talked about Isabella it's there. I'm not going to read all of it to you, but the one thing these two schools have done wonderfully is to create uh, the visual for you in words so you can get that picture in your mind. You will notice there are no photographs or um, any kind of illustration with these. I wonder if these schools have chosen to do that on purpose so that they can do that step away and not risk staff members associating this information directly with any one student. Um, it's just simply another approach and a little bit different and still somewhat similar to the way we approach our personas. You'll also see this approach used in business quite frequently and philosophically, I think it's done to help their staff better understand their customers and who specifically they're serving. You'll see Fiona Fitness, I hope, um, she's all the way over in Austri Austria, apparently, um, and she helps provide some insight to those specific organizations. It helps 
The businesses anticipate the behaviors, how the customers, especially on a website, might navigate through different pages and how they might use it, um, and to get some insight, again, into who they're serving. So a slightly different approach and somewhat similar as well. And Christine talked about there may be other practices if you want to take this to your own um, particular institution, there might be different ways that you want to approach it. Um, she talked about the full-time, part-time online student. Again, we really thought that the student and the numbers would fall out that way for us, and they just didn't make sense when we looked at it in more detail. That's part of what we learned in this process. Um, you could also look at course completion rates, or retention rates, or even graduation rates and see if there are distinct differences between those particular groups within your population that you serve. Um, we would have loved to have done some focus groups or had more qualitative survey information from our students to round out their stories and make them a little more complete like Maria's is. And we just didn't have that kind of qualitative data at that time. We also didn't have the opportunity to sit on a larger focus group, again, um, although we did go to the specific programs on a case-by-case -case basis, like Christine said, as we were um, finishing up our, our, pro our process. Um, and then we talked about pairing with marketing on the front end. You could certainly pair with marketing if it made sense on the back end and use these personas either to tell a story or to potentially use almost as virtual ambassadors for a particular program or in recruiting activities. So we hope all of this has made you think a little bit differently about the data at your organization. Uh, we are open to questions. Thank you for your previous ones. And I also have a poll since we aren't able to talk. I'm going to launch that. We were wondering Certainly, um, our contact information is on this slide as well. You're welcome to reach out to us individually if you're more comfortable than doing that during the session. Um, but we did have this discussion slide and we were just wondering if any of your schools have already implemented a similar um, study. And if you have, if you would put that in the chat so that we can look at that information. Um, as we started this program, it's sort of a running joke between Christine and I. I thought I had seen another school that did this, and I have not been able to go. I didn't save the report, and I haven't been able to find it again. So finally, we just decided I must have dreamed the similar report. So if somebody can find it, uh, they will certainly get bragging rights if, if they will share it with us. Um, and like we said before, do you think this um, particular study might have be a, something you can apply at your institution or think about policies and programs that you could impact. And that's the question in the poll. Christine, I'll leave the poll open another second. Then I'll close it and we'll see what we have, but we are getting to the, well, we're actually ahead of schedule. So we've got plenty of time to answer questions if you have any. And again, the handout is available, both of the presentation and um, some summaries of the students in case you want to see those. And if you have other questions, you are welcome to reach out directly to either of us. I'm going to close that poll and see if anybody, what everybody said. Recruiting and programs. So in terms, not too many folks at business hours, and we probably have all looked at lots of data on that before. And sometimes it can be helpful to get into, um, you know, subpopulations and when they're on campus in terms of the business hours. So um, might be helpful, but not too many of you said that. Uh, let's see. Programs offered, yes. And I think that's one thing that we saw in the data in terms of, for example, that non-credit public safety. I mean, I knew that we had a lot of students in that area, but I did not know quite how many. And 
just how long that they would be enrolled with us. Um, so for those of you who don't have similar programs at your college, these are non-credit courses that students take to keep their certification up each year. And so these are students who've been enrolled with us for five years or more. That's probably the longest relationship we have with any student. Um, and so that's really interesting to look at in terms of programs offered. Are we meeting all of their needs, even above and beyond anything that they need for their continuing, continuing education for their job? You know, are we maximizing that relationship? So that's a good example. Kim talked about the recruiting and the community partnerships. So that's something marketing was looking at um, as well in terms of for each of those student groups, each of those student personas, um, who are our community partners? Do we have good relationships? And then also looking at, which we touched on briefly, who are we not enrolling? So when we look at these student personas, who lives in our service area and could be, uh, could use our services and is not currently here? And how do we um, build community partnerships and reach out to those specific students? Um, so that is really important and, um, you know, challenging. Let's see. And I love that some of them have said strategic planning too, because we are starting to look at ours very soon. And hopefully this will provide us some insight as we move forward in that process as well. And we're working on an enrollment management plan as part of our strategic planning process. And so we're looking at these personas to kind of um, be a double check of our strategies. Do we have strategies that meet the needs of of Emily, of Kayla, and going on down the line to make sure that we are adequately supporting all of our students because, you know, one of the main reasons we did this, they might need different things. You know, a 15-year-old high school student taking courses on their high school campus probably needs something different than a 45-year-old returning to college after a long time away taking classes online. So, you know, just trying to capture the diversity of that and how we think through our services complex and important. So somebody um, saw the outline and appreciated the unique students. And one thing that you that Kim talked about in the beginning and you'll see on the handouts is the discussion questions. So we wanted folks to look at this and say, what else do we not know about our students? Um, you know, what else do you want to know in terms of you know, engaging with IE, maybe it's data that we have and we could we could help them to get access to that data or to answer their questions. And some data that we don't know, maybe qualitative information, you know, we don't know what's going on in their life. We don't know, you know, about COVID specific obstacles and just getting them to sort of think about the whole student and things that we knew and things that we didn't know. Yeah, and Christine said before, this was pre-COVID data, so um, obviously, there may be some changes that we haven't seen yet, so. Mm -hmm. And someone asked about any, did students have to complete any waivers or disclosures, disclaimers prior to participating? So we use student level data that's already in colleague, already collected. We didn't use any new information. Um, so like I said before, it's part of the regular institutional research practices. So basically, um, and I, in institutional research, we would often produce a table that says, here's, um, you know, a little bar chart of race and ethnicity, or here's by program and race and ethnicity, all of that kind of information. And so that's basically what this is, except it's grouping them in terms of those 10 distinct students and then attaching the story to them. So it's all aggregate information. Um, so you didn't, you didn't need any um, disclosures or anything like that. And you can't identify any students specifically from this. And the small ends were only in the, in the final report and the final larger reports only been released to certain individuals that are already in the program and have access to that data anyway. But it is all aggregate data. And, and that was part of why um, we, reported in our one page summaries, the, the larger percentages, um, like with with uh, gender. And we, we only do binary gender at this time, like most everybody in colleague right now, but 
we only selected some of the highest ones. We, we intentionally avoided those small ends where it was necessary. If we'd done a focus group and gotten more of that qualitative data that we would have liked to have had, we obviously would have provided waivers before we started the focus groups and, and as we invited the students in to participate. But since this was already qualitative or data we had in colleague, we didn't have those. But thank okay. you for your concern. We've been asked that before. Yes. <laughs> it's a good question. Yes. Better safe than sorry. Always ask those questions. <laughs> Are there any other questions or do you have any ideas for how you might use this on your campus? And again, we're here at the Performance Partnership Summit. So in terms of the performance measures, um, are there some ways that you're thinking this would be useful? We have a question about at what point in the project did we check in with other departments in regards to the outcomes? Um, we did that pretty close to the end. So we had a draft. It wasn't as complete as, you know, what we showed you, but it was for the most part there. And um, we shared it. So I would make sure that you have the image if you're going to do that so that you know, that department can check out that image and make sure that that's representative of their students. Um, but it was pretty well done. And that was helpful, too, because like when we met with marketing, as Kim talked about in that really good discussion, they had some other questions like, well, what about this? Like, um, I can't think of an example now, but they had just some follow up questions about some different areas that they wanted to know more. And so we um, and our revision still went back and looked at that and added some additional data points where we could. It's about 90% to be very IEIR, 90 to 92%. <laughs> we had our first draft. But we certainly wanted to ask to get that you know, perspective from individuals in those departments that might have one on one connections that we hadn't considered from from where we sit. Any other questions you guys have asked good questions so far? I was thinking about um, you could do this where your population that you're looking to categorize is the cohorts for the performance measures. And then you could think through the students who are successful or not and how they look the same or different. And that might help you to think through, um, you know, support services or um, course sequencing or a whole variety of things that you're probably already thinking about but it might help to see the students in that group and, and how, you know, maybe we had a strategy that we thought was gonna be great and ended up not having the outcomes that we wanted. And by looking at the students in that cohort and their various, you know, enrollment and, and um, course taking behavior and things like that, it might help you to see why it wasn't successful. Like maybe it was successful for this one group, but not for another. And so we wanted to dig in um, and make sure that our support services and all of that were equitable. Christine, did you see the new question that came in? Um, community partnerships hold strong for using this type of data. Could you something participants in the session give an example of how you would use this with community partners? Yeah, so for participants, this is a question for you. How, for those of you who said you could see using this with your community partnerships, how would you use it? Do you have an example? For an example of how you might use it? It 
going to leave it to us, Christine, because we're in mic. Well, I think I mentioned um, like you could use it as a double check to make sure that you have community partners in each of those areas. Um, you might look at it and, and say, you know, we need to add some new community partners. So, for example, Kim mentioned the um, transfer universities that our students went to for, for some of our curriculum programs. So maybe we didn't have a strong relationship with one of those colleges and we wanted to build that up. Um, maybe we didn't uh, fully realize how big the um, high school equivalency population was and we wanted to reach out to some new partners there. Maybe for the content of the personal interest and you wanted to find some new partners based on that, those content areas. But were you guys thinking of different ways that you would use it in terms of responding to the question from Jeff about how you would use personas to help with community partnerships? So we have another comment from, you mentioned support services. If you can identify student groups that may need specific services, you can reach out to community partners to see if they can provide some of those resources. Just thought maybe I'm, that's perfect. Yeah, so some of the student groups we said in their story, you know, hey, I have two kids at home. And so maybe we're putting it two and two together. We need to have some community partners for childcare so that we can um, offer classes at different times. And those so maybe- Go ahead, I was gonna say those partnerships can also work as we look at who isn't attending to try to do outreach to, you know, individuals and, and parallels of maybe demographics that should be attending or we'd like to see attend and especially in a particular program. But certainly those, those uh, support services could be so critical. All right, we're coming to the end of our time. Thank you everyone so much for coming to our session. If you have any other last thoughts or questions, feel free to email us and we would love to hear from you.